enjoying myself. <laughs> I don't know about anybody else, but I'm enjoying myself. Hello and welcome to another edition of Supercar Secrets. Today we're looking at how to buy one of the most iconic of cars, the Lamborghini Miura. And of course, we're joined by our resident Lamborghini expert, Ian Tyrrell. Ian, welcome back. Thank you. Welcome to the workshop. Yeah, it's great to see that uh, some of the exotica behind you there. Now, obviously, we're going to focus in this program on, on the Miura, and there's a beautiful one just over your shoulder there. Uh, incredible, to, though it may seem, um, originally, I believe that the Miura design work started out as a kind of a skunk works evening and weekend job because Mr. Lamborghini did not necessarily approve. Is that, is that really true? Well, it's, it's, actually, it's actually even further than that. Mr. Lamborghini didn't know. Um, so three of his uh, young uh, geniuses, that, I, I will use that word, that were around him, Gian Paolo Dallara, Bob Wallace and Paolo Stanzani, um, were all burning the midnight oil, unbeknown to Ferruccio Lamborghini, in his factory. Um, he set the company up to make road cars and they had other ideas. They wanted initially to go racing. Um, and Ferruccio Lamborghini fortunately was sensible enough to know, as Clint Eastwood said uh, in, the, in, I think it was Magnum Force, a man's not got to know his limitations. And um, Ferruccio did, and he didn't let his imagination and his resources run away with him. So he, he never went down the racing car route. These three guys had other ideas. Um, they stayed behind, came up with something that was on its way to being a racing car, and then eventually showed it to Ferruccio. And um, he was being an entrepreneur and very comfortable in his own skin as he was, he was delighted with their, um, with their initiative. So um, he said, well, I'll tell you what, uh, let's not, uh, let, we, we don't want to go racing, but why don't we do this as some sort of radical, radical mid-engine car, road car? Wow, because I, I think obviously, you know, we all know how beautiful the car looks now, but what surprised me was that even when they just showed the rolling chassis at the 1965 Turin show, it caused a massive reaction. Why, why was that? Well, because it was uh, unusual, um, they weren't, uh, up till that point, Lamborghini had made sort of relatively conservative Gran Turismo cars, which is what Ferruccio set out to do. Um, he had a Jaguar E-Type, one of the first E-Types, and um, he, actually, he actually is quoted as saying, why, why, who needs a V12 and Jaguar build this? He was so impressed with the E-Type. And of course, he had a Ferrari 250 GT. Um, and... Uh, it just, so it was, it was a bit, of, I think it was a shock to him, but it was also a shock to the public that Lamborghini themselves should come up with something so radical. Okay, and of course it, it got Gandini's body on, it was officially launched at Geneva the following year, and the, the rest, as they say, is history. But, you know, how, how did the car kind of evolve across from that original version to the one that we see behind us there? Um, well, there are three generations of Miura. There's the P400, the P400S, and the P400 SV. And generally speaking, <clears throat> the later they are, the more valuable they are. Um, so the, the P400 was the original, the original show car that was very hastily put into production because uh, all the world's glitterati suddenly wanted one when they'd seen it in 1966. Um, Lamborghini were forced to put this car into production because they had such an amazing opportunity to uh, turn this into um, a, a great sales um, car for them, and obviously a great brand um, halo effect car as well for the other models. Uh, so they rushed it into production, really, dare I say it, before it was ready. Um, and the chassis was too thin, for example, on the early cars. Uh, if you jacked them up in the wrong way, the whole body would flex and not, not flex back again. Um, but they, they started getting it right at various stages during production. And um, the P400 um, was, was, as I say, it was, it, there were a few compromises built into it. Um, the S became rather more developed, but the car that's behind me, the SV, um, the, uh, the, the Mura really came of age. Um, it was the first time Pirelli and Lamborghini 
had a fantastic working relationship. And the tyre technology, uh, when the Mura first came out in 66, really wasn't that fantastic. Uh, the low profile was uh, a figment of people's imagination, um, uh, even in racing cars. Uh, so um, it wasn't until 1971, when the SV behind me came out, that Pirelli had advanced tyre technology enough to catch up with Marcello Gandini's original design concept. And hence you can see um, on the back of the Mura, these very bulbous arches and these very quite wide tyres for um, a, a 1970, 71 car. Um, this is because they were pushing the boundaries technology wise at the time with this last series of Mura. Well, they were with all of them, but the technology began to catch up. Uh, and that's why these are more valuable, the SVs. Okay, well, I mean, every one of these cars has got its own story to tell. What, what can you tell us about this particular car that's in the workshop today? Well, this has, um, this has recently arrived from Miami um, via Europe. Um, and this car, uh, we're going to do a lot of work on this car, actually. Uh, at first glance, it looks great, but it's um, quite unusual in that it's one of the very few Mura SVs that started life in, in the, I can use the word iconic, it's overused, but I can use it in this case, the, uh, the lime green that these cars were so synonymous with. Uh, Verde Mura, it's called, uh, that really vibrant, bursting, larger than life, lime green. And this car is very unusual because it's an SV, but it's also was painted in that color from new. So we're going to restore the car and return it to the, uh, the lime green. Okay, well, assuming I was lucky enough to be in the market for a Mura, can you kind of walk me around the car and tell me the sort of things that I should uh, look out for in my, my purchasing decision here? Well, um, <clears throat> history and correctness and originality, more than ever, people are looking for that. <clears throat> if we think back to the, uh, the, the bad old days of the late 1980s, um, people really did some pretty awful restoration work on cars like this. And it was all about bling, it was all about uh, retrimming them with some pretty low grade leather, um, not, not about detail at all. Things have spun on their head now. People want originality, people want detail, people want correctness, people want provenance. Um, that's why we're returning this car to the lime green, for example. Um, but the, the things that people would be looking for for something like this are um, on the, the body, uh, the doors and the front and rear clamshells, the lift-up the lift lids. The car's build number from Bertoni is stamped on all of those parts. And really, um, if you want your perfect Mura, all of those five items, the, the doors, the front and rear clamshells, and the, the monocoque, the body chassis assembly, should all have the right Bertoni build number stamped on them. What I'm talking about is uh, one of the most immediately accessible numbers uh, is the Bertoni build number, which is always, strangely enough, a hundred ahead of the actual number of cars built. So, for example, if this was the 600th Mura built, the Bertoni build number would be 700. Um, and I haven't met anybody. I'm sure. I'm sure. Uh, I know somebody who could. I haven't met anybody who can actually tell me uh, what, what the reason for that is. Um, so the build number would normally be stamped on there. It's actually covered in paint on this car, but it will be under there, I'm sure, because this is a very, very genuine and original car. Um, the build number is also stamped on the doors, just under here. Um, and on the front, let me see. Yeah, there is a number there, but it's just not identifiable at the moment, but that's where the, the number would be. And also, if we're really lucky, and again, it's covered in paint here, the actual number on the body is stamped there, right in front of the windscreen in the middle. Okay, so, so, so tell me, obviously the colour's a key part of what you're going to do to this car, but 
As you look at it there today, are there any other things that jump out at you as details you perhaps want to change to restore its original provenance? Yes, um, there are some immediately obvious ones. Uh, this, this, these bars here, this is the anti-roll bar. These are reinforcing bars for the rear chassis. Um, the Americans love their chrome. <laughs> Bless them. Chrome's great, but in the right place on the right car. Um, and these, these shouldn't be chromed, actually. Um, they didn't chrome the bolts and the nuts, so we're going to um, take all the chrome off. These should be black, actually. Satin black finish, the same as the chassis. And there's nothing to stop them being lovely and smooth and beautiful and shiny in their own satin way, but they certainly shouldn't be chrome plated like that. So, um, as I say, the Americans do like adding value with chrome, um, but uh, we're just going to ratchet that back and make the car um, back to factory original in terms of uh, finishes and things like that. And what about mechanically? Have you had a chance to assess the mechanical condition of the car? We haven't. This car's only just arrived. Um, it starts and runs, uh, and I'm going to let you hear it before we finish the video. But um, no, this, we, we haven't done a full assessment of this car yet. Uh, the weather's been too bad. It's been pouring with rain every day, so I can't take it for a road test. <laughs> Oh, how terrible, how terrible. I know, I know. I'm, 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 I'm up for buying it, I've got my checkbook out. You know, what am I going to have to pay for? I, you mentioned that the more recent models like this one are the most valuable. So let's work our way back. What, what would I have to pay for something like this one here? Okay. Um, the most valuable mirrors of the lot are the SVJ, which was a uh, one of these which were sort of a... Um, a modified Jota replica, as they're called, to keep it simple. But um, and they, they are all individually priced, five, um, five or six, depending on um, who you speak to, SVJs, uh, and whether you consider production cars production or not. But um, really, for an SV um, in pounds, you you won't find an SV for under two million now. Um, if it's a properly restored car with really good provenance, um, if it's done by one of the proper people, because that's important as well, this car, when it's finished, I would say is probably going to be worth two and a quarter million pounds, something like that, maybe a bit more. Um, the S, the next model down, uh, which doesn't have these bulbous wheel arches, this is the main difference between the S and the SV. As I say, this is how Gandini originally envisaged the car to be right from the word go, with these wide tyres. These aren't the right tyres, actually, they're Michelin's. Um, should be on Pirelli's. But um, this is what he envisaged, and this is why the SVs are the most sought after. They're the meanest to look at, they're the meanest to drive, they're closest to the original vision. Um, but the S, with its slightly narrower rear tyres and less bulbous rear wheel arches, in pounds, one to one and a quarter million. Um, and the P400, the original model, uh, you're talking round about 750, 800,000 pounds, something that order of magnitude. And, and, and you have to be very careful how you jack that car up or your, your 800,000 could be uh, substantially uh, reduced. Yeah, exactly, yes. That they are, they are very delicate. Um, in fact, if we, uh, if we walk over here, um, this is a Miura S. Here's one we sort of halfway through earlier. So this is a Miura S. That, uh, this is the car that uh, sold at RM Auctions a year ago in London. It hit the headlines. It, it's yellow, this car. Um, and uh, it was very original. And it was a, sold, um, it, the car lived in the Black Forest. Um, it's a, gentle, a German gentleman who's bought it now. He sent the car to us for full restoration. We're a year into it. Um, but to, to go back to your point about jacking the car up, um, a lot of the metal work on the car is um, it's just very, very thin, cheap man, really. Um, we've, uh, James, our metal fabricator, has completely refabricated the, the, the bottom part of this car. Um, but if you look here, um, it's just, it's literally bits of sheet metal. This is how Gian Paolo Dallara originally developed the Miura. Um, uh, it's all just pressed steel, welded with these particularly not great welds. 
This is this was Bertoni sort of Marchesi welding in the 1960s. Pretty awful, actually, dare I say. In fact, we have to make the welds. Um, we have to actually make them deliberately bad so that they match the rest of the car. <laughs> we can't yeah. use beautiful modern stitch welding because it will look out of place. Uh, so uh, it's, it's all about getting, I mean, it sounds crazy, but it's about getting those details right, really. No, that's, that's, that's awesome. So, so um, I mean, this is obviously is one that you've, uh, you're in the middle of restoring. Are you aware of any murals still being discovered in barns in Tuscany? Are there any out there hiding that we don't know about? Yes. Um, I was uh, involved with the car years ago. There was a, a gentleman who lived in the south of France. Um, not too far from Côte d'Azur, just a bit inland, uh, an ex Le Mans French racing driver called Gérard Gomber, or La Gombe, as he was called. Um, and I, I visited him twice, actually. And he, uh, he, he had all old cars in his garden with trees going through them, um, one thing or another. And uh, I mean, to say he was eccentric is slight understatement. Um, and when he died, he died in test state. So he, he, the, the local mayor, the local council had to seize all the, the goods in his uh, grounds, in his garden. And they went round with a metal detector. And lo and behold, it started going peep, peep, peep very loudly over a patch of mud that we'd been walking over when I went to visit him. And they started digging what was underground, about half of a Miura. Um, <laughs> So that car is now being completely remade, the whole chassis, the whole body. It can all be, you can actually make a Mura virtually from scratch, as you can with those. I, I, I tell you what, Ian, I've heard of tax avoidance schemes, but I think that one definitely takes the biscuit. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Very um, good. Yeah. So they, they, things like that are still happening, these crazy stories. Um, I mean, there was a situation recently where somebody made up a story about a car um, that was uh, uh, found, but you don't have to really, because they, these things are still going on. Fantastic. So as we come to the end of our time together on this one, Ian, uh, uh, I, I know how hard you work, for example, on finding the, the Italian job mirror. Where, where does the Lamborghini mirror live in your kind of overall hall of motoring fame? Oh, uh, if I had a top 20, top 10 cars I could collect, there would definitely be a Mura in there somewhere. Now Ian, you did say that we could have a listen to the Mura, so why don't you just jump in there and start it up for us? Okay, so I'll start this up and give you a little bit of Mura magic, okay? Okay. Thanks for sharing that with us today, and uh, uh, hopefully we'll be back together again soon for another episode of Supercar Secrets. Thank you. Cheers.